Amen. Well, repeat this after me. I was made for times like these. Say it like you mean it now. I was made for times like these. I was born for the supernatural. Let's say that again. I was born for the supernatural. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. I feel like the scripture that the Lord gave me for you all is 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. And it says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Can anybody hang on to that word today? I'm talking about people have never seen or never heard of all of the things that God has planned for those who love him. What a scripture to hold on to. What a scripture that Joe talked about, the remarkable, miraculous things are going to flow in your life to benefit others. That's pretty powerful. That's what I want for my life. Am I in the right place? Amen. Amen. How many of you believe in visions in the room? I'm in the right place. I know it. Well, this week I feel like the Lord gave me a vision while I was studying. And uh, the Bible says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 that it shall come to pass that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Well, I saw a vision this week, so I guess God is calling me young, and I'm okay with that. But I did, and so as I was studying, I saw this beautiful lighthouse. Picture a lighthouse. Can you guys see it? So I saw this beautiful lighthouse, and all along the horizon from the lighthouse, there were storms. There were waves, huge waves in this vision. There was a fog that was all across the water, there was rain and thunder and lightning, but one thing was very clear in this vision, and that was the lighthouse and its light that, sh that shined in the middle of the darkness. Its path was a clear way to the steady ground. And so in this vision, I was just looking at it, and my natural mind, how many of you like to think of the natural mind? My natural mind was thinking, wow, Jesus, there you are, that lighthouse. And then the Lord began to redirect me, and he said, no, you're the lighthouse. And I began to think about it, and I thought, why me? Why am I the lighthouse? And he began to show me this beautiful lighthouse that was shining bright. And then he began to say that that was me. And he began to tell me that this lighthouse is fastened to this rock, this steady ground. And he said, see, that's me. That's what you are to fasten your life to, the steady rock and your job, your purpose is to shine that light to a world that's filled with all kinds of storms and rain and fog and situations that they don't know how to get out of. But you need to connect to me, stable and sturdy, and shine that light for others to see. Amen? So what light are you projecting for people in troubled times? Will they see the pathway to safety through your light? Or will they crash the shore because of all of the turbulence around? See, there's security for those who've anchored themselves in the rock. Amen? Our responsibility is to connect and be that beacon of hope. Some of us need to change our light bulbs. Amen? Amen. So, I want to tell you today that God has never needed the majority in order to win. How many of you know that about God? He's never needed everybody's vote in order to win. In fact, he doesn't need any of us to participate in order to win. All throughout Scripture, he shows record-breaking victories with only a handful of people. That's all he needs is a few people who will believe him. And I believe that in this season, that's what God's looking for. He's looking for a remnant, a select few of people just like, just like David only needed a few stones to take down the giant. That's what God's looking for in this season. And he promises us in Scripture that if his people, everybody say his, his people will humble themselves, they will pray, and they will seek his face, that he would hear from heaven and he will heal our land. Even his word tells us that he doesn't need everyone to participate. The only people he needs are his. If his people will humble themselves and pray. He will heal our land. All he needs is us to heal this land, for us to participate 
in humbling ourselves and praying. So if he promises us he'll heal the land, I'm believing for God to heal our land. Our nation needs healing, and we are standing as his sons and daughters to see that come to pass. You know, I wonder what our nation would look like would look like if we made more of our conversations about miracles and the presence of God. I wonder what our nation would look like if we started talking about all the people who got set free from drug addictions. I wonder what would happen to our nation if all of our social media posts started talking about the goodness of God and how he set us free, how when we didn't know how we were going to make it, he made a way for us. What if we started talking about how great God shows up in the middle of famine and war? What would our nation look like? You know, what would our news feed look like if we started stop debating over this? Because, you know, a lot of times I feel like we put, we put things in perspective that we shouldn't. Our job is to be the lighthouse. Our job is to be the light. Our job is to believe that God's going to heal our land. I find it very funny that the Hebrew calendar this year was declared to be the year of the voice, the year of the roar. That's what our calendar year said that this was supposed to be a type and a symbol of. But everything about this year has been about isolation, seclusion, covering your weapon of war, the mouth, the voice that God has given us. And so it's time for that remnant, that small group of people. It doesn't have to be everyone, but it does have to be us. It does have to be the sons and daughters to rise up in that place of prayer. And I want to declare one thing. They may can silence some things, but they can't silence your prayer closet. They can't silence your declarations. They cannot silence what God has put on the inside of you. And it's time for us, that remnant, to rise up and go to battle for our families. It's time for us to go to battle for our cities. And I want to tell you, there's power in your voice. There's power in the words that God has given you to speak. Do you know that you can overthrow darkness from your prayer room? You can take down high things, that you can shift atmospheres all from the place of your home. We're a mighty army, and I believe that it's time for us to be charged. Amen? So tell your neighbor, stretch yourself a little bit. I'm going to stretch. Amen. And so as I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to share? What do you want me to talk about today? They've heard a lot of sermons, right? And I feel like the Lord brought me back to something that I shared about a year ago, and it was called Five Things That Mark a Supernatural Church. And I feel like the Lord wanted me to remind you of those five things today. You see, this Bible is a book of supernatural It's a book of supernatural things. It's marked by people who raised the dead. It's marked by people who had food that fell from heaven. It's marked by donkeys that talked. It's marked by fish that showed up with money in their mouth. It's marked with diseases falling off of people. It's marked with bushes that burned and people thought people heard a voice out of the bush. It's marked with blind people who got their sight back. It's marked by waves obeying a voice. It's marked by a few men defeating an entire army. That's the kind of gospel that he left us with. This is our mandate. This is who we are. And I am not. I didn't sign up for a watered-down, weak, dry gospel. I signed up for miracles. I signed up seeing dead things come back to life. I signed up for seeing the miraculous because that's the kind of God I serve. Amen? And I don't know about you, but all of these stories aren't stories. They're a guidebook for our lives. I don't want to be content with a normal life, but I want the supernatural life. Amen? Amen. So what kind of Christianity did you sign up for? It's one of miracles. Amen? So I don't want to be comfortable when Jesus calls me out of the boat. I think a lot of people love what it looks like to be out of the boat, but that dock seems so stable. Have you ever seen somebody trying to get in a boat? I had a little thing happen to me this week. We were out swimming, and (laughs) there was this float in the water, and I was so confident that I was going to be able to leave the concrete and get on this little float in the water. 
But I want to tell you, it was only a few seconds and Joe was really cracking up laughing at me because I was drenched from head to toe because it wasn't very stable on that little float. <laughs> In fact, it threw me all the way off underneath the water, full soaked wet, I'm telling you, because that's what, that's what the supernatural looks like sometimes. It always doesn't look like something that's going to be easy, but that's okay. It's worth the risk. Tell your neighbor it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. All right, now y'all don't go to sleep on me, okay? I want to talk about five things, five signs of a supernatural church. We need an awakening, and it's not coming through politics. It's not coming through dry religion. It's coming through the sons and the daughters of God who are fully awakened. It's coming through the supernatural church. And the first thing that a supernatural church is marked by is it's marked by hunger. Everybody say hunger. Hunger, and that is a strong desire or a craving. It's how your stomach's going to feel here in a few minutes. Hunger, right? But I'm talking about spiritual hunger. And you know, when I got saved, I remember I attended a place called the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida. And that church had become a lightning rod for the power of God. And I remember on Father's Day, it happened in 1995, the Holy Spirit showed up in unprecedented power. Our nation had, hadn't seen anything like that in a really long time. They were marked by spiritual hunger. Hundreds of people would flock to the church in the early hours in the morning just to go to church at 7 o'clock that night. They would open the doors, and the 2,000-seat sanctuary would fill up in about two minutes. People would run. I remember we had a strategy, like take the right so that we can get down to the front, because we were hungry. We wanted to be close to the presence of God. We wanted to encounter God. And I remember I would take my spring breaks, and I would take my summer breaks, and I would go down there just to be around those encounters with God, because why? I was hungry. I was willing to make the drive. Joe made the drive, went to church, and then drove home because why? He was hungry. He wanted to be around it. And I want to tell you that alcoholics and drug addicts were delivered. Marriages were restored. Over 200,000 people were saved. And this went on for five years. Four million people from all over the world came. Why? Because they were hungry. And a supernatural church is marked by hunger. I remember people being slain in the spirit in the church, and we would have to pick them up and take them to the car. They couldn't even walk. I remember people in the parking lots. They would get slain in the spirit, and they would take traffic cones and just put around them so nobody would drive over them, you know. They were just, I mean, I'm telling you, there was such a powerful move that people were hungry for it. It's pretty supernatural when teenagers want to go to church instead of the beach. There's a hunger there. The Bible says in Matthew 5 and verse 6 that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Matt Psalms 107 and 9 says he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. We need to be hungry. Amen. All right, number two. The second thing is they are present seekers. Everybody say present seekers. There's a story in Scripture, 2 Samuel chapter 6, and it tells the story of David's journey to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And I love this story. You're probably very familiar with it, but back in those days, uh, the presence of the Lord was housed in the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine? I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit chose us to be the housing place of the presence of God. Isn't that a miracle that we don't have to go to a place to feel God? But he decided to live within us. But back in those days, they would have to be, in the, be around the presence by coming to the ark. And so David wanted to move it back to Jerusalem. So in his attempt, on his way to move the ark back, a man died because they did it the wrong way. And so all of a sudden, Dave, David pulls the reins on everything, and he's like, Obed-Edom, can you just keep it in your house? We can't kill anybody else, basically. And so he had to go get a new plan, figure out how the Lord wanted him to do it. So Obed-Edom decides this box just killed a man, basically, but now he's going to put it in his house. Because a supernatural church requires you to seek the presence. And so all of a sudden, the Bible tells us that Obed-Edom and his entire house were blessed. It said the Lord blessed his house and all that belonged to him. 
So not only his house, but everything that belonged to him were blessed. I mean, can you imagine his livestock were probably blessed? Everything was blessed. So he began to house the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine the talk he probably had with his kids? Do not get around the Ark. I mean, I can't imagine. I would just have to tape it off. Don't even go in the room (laughs) because it was that powerful. It was the presence of God. But I'm telling you, presence seekers are willing to pay the price. Presence seekers are hungry for the presence of God. It means everything to them. And Obed-Edom was willing to do that. And can you imagine if that was the only way we could access his presence? Let's just say that the ark decided to come to the Cornelius household. They're excited. (laughs) This is what it would have been like for Obed-Edom. He would have, this is what we would have done. Okay, Joe, pack up the kids and everything we have because if the ark is moving, so are we. That's exactly what happened to Obed-Edom because when David decided, okay, we're going to go ahead, we know how to do it now. We're going to bring the ark back. This is what happened. Obed-Edom decided that I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to stay where I am. Those three months of having the presence in his home ruined him. It ruined him. He couldn't be without it. And we have that presence right here within us. Amen? And I cannot tell you enough personal stories of how the presence of God has gotten me out of the darkest times in my life. I'm telling you, his presence will deliver you and set you free no matter what you have been through. I remember these one of the hardest times in our life. I didn't know what our future was going to look like. We didn't either one of us have jobs. We had had a new baby. We built a new house all in about a few months. And all of a sudden, Obed-Edom factor, the presence factor showed up in the middle of my confusion and fear and changed everything. And it didn't mean that anything had changed in my life. It meant that the presence took the oppression. It took the fear. It took the worry. It took the, the stress and the pressure. I'm telling you, the presence of God will drive out the confusion that you're dealing with. The presence of God will do spiritual warfare for you. If you invite his presence in, things will begin to shift and change. And I want to tell you one more thing too, business owners, the presence of God will shift your business. The presence of God will shift your children, moms and dads. The presence of God is your pow- is a powerful thing. And hungry people seek his presence. Amen? Amen. Bill Johnson says this. He says that the atmosphere is a big deal for him. There are two things that I keep my focus on, the principles of the kingdom and the presence of the king. You end up having a lot more stuff happen that way. When the glory of of God begins to come into a room, I don't have to stop or teach because I don't have anything more to say. It's all about his presence. And that's where we have to be. Amen. I remember hearing stories about Catherine Kuhlman, and she would just walk into the room with her beautiful, flowy clothes, (laughs) and she would just welcome the Holy Spirit. She would just welcome him in the room. She was so familiar with his presence. He would show up, and wheelchairs would begin to empty out. He would show up, and, and blind people would get their sight back, all because of the presence of God. You can't invite God in and not expect something out of the box to happen, and that's okay. I want to be really good at, get, at letting God break my box because I want to tell you, it may not look like what we want it to look like, but I want to be really good at welcoming him and letting him have his way. Amen? Amen. All right, the third thing is that they operate in faith. Everybody say faith. I would ask you to spell it, but I want to challenge you. I've often heard this, that faith is spelled like this, R-I-S-K. Faith is risk. It's exactly what it is. Has God ever asked you to do something and you're like, I don't know if I should do that. (laughs) That happens like I'm on the daily for me. But it's a risk. It's a risk to believe God and step out in faith. And I don't want to live a watered-down version of the gospel I want my faith to be with action and with works. Amen? That's what we're called to. The Bible says in Romans 4 and verse 3, because Abraham believed God, faith was transferred. His faith transferred righteousness in his account. What transferred transferred God's righteousness into Abraham? His faith. His faith that God told him that he 
that his descendants would be like the sand on the seashores and the scars, stars in the sky. Imagine God telling you that, and you're old, and you don't have any children. But Abraham believed God, and it all manifested. We're all products of it because of a, a man believed what God told him, even when it looks impossible. Has God ever told you some impossible things before? Don't you stop believing what he said. Take the risk. Be willing to say yes to him. Be willing to say yes to his promises. Amen? Amen. The fourth thing, a supernatural church is marked by signs, wonders, and miracles. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Through the apostles, many signs and wonders were set up among the people, and wonderful things were done. They all met regularly and in harmony. But, but even though people admired them, the outsiders were a little bit weary. On the other hand, they did put their trust in the master. They carried people who were sick out into the streets, and they laid them on stretchers, bedrolls, hoping that they would be touched by Peter's shadow. They came to the villages and throngs of them being sick and filled with the devil, but they were all healed. Everybody say all healed. Can you imagine people coming to Texarkana because of your shadow? Why not? That's the kind of miracle working God that we have. I don't know about you, but he is the tree and I am his fruit. And you know what? I look just like him. I, ha I carry the same spirit as him. I carry that spirit of resurrection power and so do you. And I want to challenge you today. I want to light that fire that I know is within you and just say, you were born for the supernatural. You were born for times like these. You were born to break the box and go ahead and see the miraculous happen. I believe that. I believe that there could be a line of people just waiting to walk into the presence of God outside our church. I'm not moved by all, all he needs is a remnant. All he needs is a few stones. All he needs is a people who believe him. And that's who we are. Amen? Amen. If we are reading his words, we should be experiencing his power. Has anybody ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Yes. I love the stories about him. Smith one time told a man that didn't have a leg or feet to go and buy shoes. And all he had was these stumps. But he went. Why? Because faith is a risk. He could have looked at Smith and thought he was crazy, but he went anyways. He goes to the shoe store, and the guy asks him what size, and he says eight, color black. Why? Because faith is a risk. And all of a sudden, he puts his legs out. What if you were the salesman? I was thinking about that. He puts his legs out, and while the man was putting the shoes on him, guess what? His feet and his legs began to grow because faith is a risk, and that's the kind of God that we serve, the miraculous God. If no hands were ever laid on the sick, we may not ever see the miracle, but that's what we're called to. The legs grew out into the shoe. And the fifth thing that marks a supernatural church is it's filled with supernatural people. You know, I don't want my children growing up just thinking that God is just a Sunday morning duty. It's just a service that we go to. No, no, no. He's so much more than that. I don't want them thinking that it's just something that we do. I want them growing up supernatural. I want them believing that they have the power to do miracles. I want them believing that they can reroute a hurricane, that they can stop a storm. Why? Because their father does it, and he gave him his spirit so that he could move, so that they could move in those same signs and wonders. I want them to believe that they can change history with their lives because we can, because it's a risk but the reward is always worth it for those who will believe God. I want to end today as the band comes with this statement. It's from A.W. Tozer. And this is the, the statement. A scared world needs a fearless church. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people right now who are really scared. There's a lot of people who don't have the answers, and they need your lighthouse. They need your light. They need your faith. They need the hope that you carry on the inside of you. They need the promises that you've anchored your life in. 
And that's our responsibility as believers to say yes to God. It's our season and it's our time. We need to show up hungry, ready for the presence, full of faith and miracles. Now, I'll tell you, I don't pretend to know everything and I don't pretend to have all of the answers. But one thing I do know is this, that if we invite him, he will come. If we invite him into our home, if we invite him into our finances, if we invite him into our children's problems, if we invite him into our workplaces, he'll show up because he's a keeper of his promises. And he says, if you'll seek me, then you'll find me if you seek me with all of your heart. And today we do want to offer an individual time of prayer, but this is kind of what I saw. I just saw us all come into the altar and just, just seeking his presence like I talked about just crying out to him. Because I'm telling you, this is a season where the world needs your overflow. They need what you have on the inside, but you got to have something. I love Bill Johnson's quote. He says, I want to spend my life giving all this encouragement away because I have so much. And that's our mandate. Our, our job, our assignment here on the earth is to be that beacon of hope so that others can find a pathway to safety, a rescuer, a deliverer, a way maker, a promise keeper. That's what we're the light for. And so I just want to invite you just to come. I don't have anything fancy to say, but let's seek the Lord. If we invite him, he's going to show up. If we invite him, he might, he's, he's going he's gonna to maybe give you a word. He might give you a promise. He might manifest a miracle in your body. There's nothing too hard for God. And so just stand in, on your feet today. And I just want to invite you, make your way down this altar. This is something I did today in worship. I thought, I'm just going to make me a lap. Why? Because I want to break my box. I want to get out of my own way. Because I believe in the power and the presence of God. And so, Lord, I thank you this morning. This is a group of hungry people. This is a group of people who are present seekers. This is your remnant. Scoot on up a little bit, everybody. This is your remnant. This is your group. These are your chosen ones. These are your people who are called by your name. And we just thank you today. Come on, some of you just need to say, break my box, Lord. I've been too comfortable. I've been too happy with where I am, but I want to say yes to the waters. I want to I say yes as you call. I'll take the R-I-S-K because I believe you. I believe your promises today. Thank you, Lord.